John 19, verse 1, the Bible says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man! When the chief priest therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king! But they cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him and two other with them on either one side and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews and the Pilate, Write not the King of the Jews, but then he said, I'm the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Heavenly Father, bless, I pray, the reading of your word, the preaching to follow. Lord, I pray that you'd empty me of self and self's desire, any thought of foolish vain glory. May I exalt you and accurately preach your word. Do your perfect work through your perfect word this morning. We'll glorify you on that account. These things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. There is, among other things, in John chapter 19, verses 1 through 22, an argument taking place between Pilate and the people. That argument is summed up in a word that occurs multiple times in those handful of verses. It's the word king. Of all things, there's an argument over who the king of the Jews is. And it's, it's sort of an unusual argument in the sides that we see forming. We see the Jews who have always despised the rule of Rome and their dominion under them, who have always wanted their freedom and always proclaimed that Messiah was coming to deliver them, inexplicably taking the side of King Caesar in this, saying, We have no king but Caesar. On the other hand, you see Pilate, a Roman through and through, one beholden to them for his position and his power, one that you would think would be taking the side of King Caesar and all things, inexplicably taking the side of King Jesus and saying, Behold your king, behold your king, behold your king. And finally, we see those two sides and those two arguments meeting and culminating in the most odd of places, namely over the head of the Lord Jesus Christ as he hangs on Calvary. Matthew 27, 37 says that it was written over his head, this inscription, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The cross, as is well known, though some in recent days have tried to recast it as an X, the cross is a beam this way and a beam this way, and over his head there is an accusation fastened. So we see two pieces of wood and three nails, a main beam, a cross beam, a nail for each hand, one nail to pierce through both feet. 
That simple arrangement was enough to crucify the darling Lamb of God and pay the entire sin debt of all mankind for all times. There's never been a more glorious thing than one Savior, two pieces of wood, three nails, and four given. But may I point out this morning, there was another little glorious detail to the arrangement that it would be well worth our time to look at. There was, in fact, one more nail on that cross that day. It didn't hold Jesus in place. It held a message about Jesus in place. Look one more time at John chapter 19, verse 19. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. One nail, one statement, eight words. It was normal and customary for each person crucified to have their crimes published in this way. The two men on either side undoubtedly had their accusations over their heads as well. On their crosses there would have been a sign that said, Thief. When a person killed another, a soldier would nail the word murderer up over his head. In this way, everyone walking by would know why the person was dying and would be encouraged not to commit the same crimes lest they face the same fate. But throughout the history of crucifixion, there was never an odder accusation ever nailed over anyone's head, ever nailed at the top of anyone's cross than the one that hung over Jesus' head and was fastened to his cross. The message of that fourth nail tells us that this man, Jesus, died because he was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. For the next few moments, I want to preach on the fourth nail. Notice, first of all, the fourth nail held a message that was unusual. Again, in John chapter 19, verse 19, the Bible says, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, what made this message unusual is that it was unequivocally positive, not negative. Everyone else ever crucified had a crime, either real or trumped up, written over his head. Jesus was the only exception to this in the history of crucifixion. Countless had been crucified with the word murderer over their head, and mostly rightfully so perhaps. Thousands had been crucified with the word thief over their head, and probably justifiably. Thousands had been crucified with the word fornicator or adulterer or adulteress over their heads. Thousands had been crucified with the words enemy of the state, treason written over their head. Thousands had been crucified with the words does not revere the emperor written over their heads. But what in the world was anybody ever going to be able to put over the head of Jesus as an accusation? What possible options were there? Jesus of Nazareth, healer of blinded eyes. Jesus of Nazareth, healer of deaf ears. Jesus of Nazareth, healer of muted tongues. Jesus of Nazareth, feeder of hungry, needy multitudes. Jesus of Nazareth, raiser of the dead. Jesus of Nazareth, a man kind to the little children. Jesus of Nazareth, a man who freed those possessed by demons. Jesus of Nazareth, the man who walked on water. Jesus of Nazareth, he whom the winds and waves obeyed. Jesus of Nazareth, the healer of the paralyzed. Jesus of Nazareth, the friend of sinners, Jesus of Nazareth, greatest of all preachers, Jesus of Nazareth, the man who never sinned, no matter what they wrote of him, if it were truthful, it would have to be positive. Anyone else they ever crucified, they could at least ignore the 99% of good things they had done and pick out the 1% bad. But with Christ, it was 100% good from start to finish. In fact, it was better than that. It was 100% perfect. If Pilate had wanted to, he could not have found one single negative thing to honestly nail over the cross of Christ. Luke 23, 4, Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. John 19, 4, Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. John 19, 6, when the chief priest therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him, Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. He looked, my goodness did he look, if he could have found a single thing wrong in the behavior or character of Christ, he could have blown it out of 
a portion, twisted it really good, written it up, nailed it to the cross, made all the Jews happy and covered his own backside along the way. But he did not and could not find one single fault in the Lord Jesus Christ. So on that day when the hammer rang out as it struck that fourth nail, a message like no other was hung over the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. Examine him all you want from history. Examine him all you want from the scriptures. Examine him all you want from life. You will never find a fault in Jesus. So the fourth nail held a message that was unusual. Number two, the fourth nail held a message that was universal. John 19, 20 says, This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Now when Pilate wrote what he wrote, he did not just simply settle for one language in which to place it. He picked out three languages, in fact, to do it. He picked out Greek and Hebrew and Latin. Hebrew was the language of the Jewish people. It was their hometown dialect. That's what anybody from there would be expected to know. Greek was the Hellenistic language, the language of culture. Anywhere you went across the world, people of learning spoke this language. Latin was the legal language of the Roman Empire. People really had to know the language if they wanted to to really get anywhere because Rome was in charge of the world. So by putting that message over the head of Jesus in those three languages, Pilate, really God through Pilate, ensured that anybody across the world could either read it or have it read to them. Nobody was left out out of this message and that is so much like our God Romans 10 13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved 2 Peter 3 9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but as long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance 1 John 2 2 and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world Revelation 5 9 they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Acts 1, 8, But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts 10, 34, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, I perceive the truth that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. Jesus Christ, the Jew, willingly died for every old person, every young person, every male person, every female person, every rich person, every poor person, every smart person, every dumb person, every white person, every black person, every Native American person, every Hispanic person, every Oriental person, every Hawaiian person, every Native American person, every Middle Eastern person, every European person, every mixed race person, every pure race person, every I don't know what I am race people. He died for every church goer and every drunk in the gutter. He died for every virgin and every prostitute. He died for every honest hard worker and every low-down thief. He died for everybody living in a mansion and everybody living under a bridge. He died for everybody that's never touched illegal drugs and for everybody with more tracks on their arms than a railroad. And he'll save any person on earth that simply repents of their sins and trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior. There's only one truly level spot on this earth and it's the foot of the cross where Jesus Christ died for all. So the fourth nail held a message that was unusual, and the fourth message held a mess or the fourth nail held a message that was universal. Number three, the fourth nail held a message that was unsettling. Verse 21, then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Now remember where we started here. This was all an argument that developed over 22 verses between Pilate and the Jewish people over who exactly the king was. I truly love the way God calls us things to boomerang back on people, don't you? When the Jews crucified Christ, they didn't just want him dead, they also wanted him discredited. They wanted him humiliated. They wanted to embarrass him so badly that no one would ever even admit to having been a follower of his. They figured to hang him naked in front of the millions of people there for Passover and have all of them going back home laughing at him. Imagine their surprise then when those proud Jews looked up at the beaten, naked, pierced body of Jesus Christ and saw the words, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. 
Oh my goodness, I wonder what kind of teasing they themselves took from the Roman soldiers on that day. Hey, Annas, hey, Caiaphas, that's some king you got there. Mighty impressive. Well, I bet the whole world just trembles in fear at your mighty Jewish nation. With a king like that, I bet Rome's going to surrender to you every day now and give you your freedom. You bet, we better just beg you not to hurt us as powerful as you are. No wonder the Jews raced furiously back to Pilate and said, hey, you got to change that. That's embarrassing to us. Don't write that he's the king of the Jews. Write that he said he was the king of the Jews. Can I make an observation here? You might want to be real careful what you wish for because you might actually get it. And when the devil gives you what you want, you could be 100% certain it is never going to work out like you planned. These Jews were humiliated. How in the world could something like this have ever happened to them? So the fourth nail held a message that was universal, and a message that was unusual, and a message that was unsettling. But number four, the fourth nail held a message that was unchangeable. Look at verse 22 again. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. All through the early record that we have of Pilate in the scripture, he is the epitome of a waffling politician sticking his finger in the wind to see which way the winds of popularity are blowing. He would fit well in our culture, don't you think? But after all this time, Pilate, the waffling politician, finally got a backbone. The scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees had manipulated him and pushed him and threatened him and made this powerful man a little more than a puppet. But here at the very end of his role in this, he finally stomps his little political foot and says, No, I've crucified an innocent man because you demanded it, and now everybody's going to know who he is. He's your king. Deal with it. And there's a couple things at work here. First of all, they had no more leverage over him. Remember, they said, Whoso speaketh against Caesar is not Caesar's friend. Who's making himself a king? Not Caesar's friend. We're going to tell Caesar that you're on his side instead of Caesar's side. But now with Jesus hanging on a cross, that's not a problem anymore. They don't have that leverage to hold over him. They literally have nothing to threaten him with. You know, if you get your way by threats, you'll eventually find out you have nothing left to work with. And at that point, I promise you, whoever you've been threatening will at that point do the exact opposite of what you've been wanting them to do. But here's the second thing going on, much more important than the first. The Jews were not allowed to put anybody to death. They had to use Rome to do it. That's how Pilate got involved in this to start with. But under Roman law, once a man was convicted of a crime and had his crime written out and nailed to that cross, it could not be changed, and anyone changing it could themselves be found guilty and crucified. That fourth nail held a message that was protected by the highest law of the land. But may I say that's just a shadow of the real law that held it in place. Not only could the writing not be changed because of the law of Rome, the writing could not be changed because of the very law of heaven. The devil has, since the very beginning, tried to change the divine sentence as to who Jesus is, but the law of heaven has not allowed it. He is the Son of God, and God the Son, and the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the only way of salvation. Atheists have tried for years to change the divine sentence as to who Jesus is, but the law of heaven would not allow it. He is the creator, the sustainer, the life giver, the self-existent God, and the only way of salvation. Agnostic Gnostics have tried to change for years the divine sentence as to who Jesus is, but the law of heaven would not allow it. He's the one who became flesh and dwelt among us, the one who rose from the dead with many infallible proofs and the only way of salvation. So-called scientists have tried for years to change the divine sentence as to who Jesus is, but the law of heaven has not allowed it. He's the one who made everything from nothing and spoke light itself into existence, has authority over every operation of the universe and the only way of salvation. Liberal Bible-denying college professors have tried for years to change the divine sentence as to who Jesus is, but the law of heaven has not allowed it. He's the virgin-born Son of God, fully God and fully man all at once, utterly sinless, perfect in word, thought in deed, and the only way of salvation. Wicked pastors, lost and undone, yet guiding precious sheep have tried for years to change the divine sentence as to who Jesus is, but the law of heaven has not allowed it. He's the one who came specifically to die for the sins of all mankind, the one who will judge the world, the one who will one day say, depart from me, all ye that work iniquity and he's the only way of salvation. Authors with flowing pens full of poison have tried for years to change the divine sentence as to who Jesus is but the law of heaven's not allowed it. He is the historical. He's coming again to rule and reign on this earth. He's the only way of salvation. From age to age he is the same everlasting, immutable, unchangeable. His character has not been tarnished. His power has not been diminished. His authority has not lessened. His eternality has not shortened. His saving power has not been eradicated. He's still the one and only way of salvation. 
For all the reference to erase his name from history, more men know of him now than ever before. For all their attempts to make men hate him, millions across the world now make men love him enough to be willing to die for him. For all their sarcastic comments about him being a child of fornication, billions know the truth that he's the Son of God and God the Son. They hated that sign over the cross. They despised the message of the fourth nail, but they could not change it. So the fourth nail held a message that was universal and unusual and unsettling and unchangeable. But the fourth nail held a message that was also unforgettable. John 19, 19 again. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Eight words, five of them are single syllables. Two are only one, two syllables. And then there's Nazareth with three. Every word was simple and straightforward. There were no huge, impressive vocabulary words to be found here. This was written in simple prose. There was no poetry to it, no rhythm, no rhyme, no meter. There was no punchline. There was no suspense. Yet something about this message, the content of it, has made it utterly unforgettable. So what exactly was it about this message over Jesus' head that made it so unforgettable? Well, first of all, it said something about why he came. And the first word you see is his name, Jesus. That simple name in Hebrew, Greek, or Latin means the exact same thing. It means salvation. The Jews said that he hung there because he blasphemed. The fourth nail held a message that told the truth of the matter. He was hanging there because he came to die to save men from their sin. Romans 5, 8, But God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John fifteen thirteen, Greater love hath no man than this than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Luke nineteen ten, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost, the first word on the cross, Jesus, lets you know beyond doubt that he came for you and he left heaven for you and he died for you and he rose for you and he'll save you if you'll let him. It also said something about where he came from. When, when the Jews saw the word Nazareth over his head and then they saw him called the king of the Jews, it infuriated them. Their king would surely come from Jerusalem, the great city. Anything less would be an offense to them. Nazareth was a tiny, dirty, low-class little outpost on the edge of Israel. There was nothing glorious or noteworthy about Nazareth. In fact, when Nathaniel heard Philip say the Messiah had been found and that he was from Nazareth, this future apostle said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? This was the most crushing blow imaginable to the pride of the Jews. The very idea that their king could ever be from Nazareth. Now, there's a good reason why God did it that way because the only thing standing between men and salvation is their own stinking pride over and over again. James 4.10 Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord he shall lift you up. 1 Peter 5.6 Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You will humble yourself to receive him or you will not receive him. It also said something about who he is. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. If he's their king, he's our king. The Bible makes it clear that the king of the Jews, the Messiah, is also the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's God. He's Jehovah. He's the one who death could not hold. He's the creator. He's the soon coming king. Since he's their king, he's our king. This message was unforgettable. We're still singing of it, still speaking of it, still shouting about it. Men and women and boys and girls are still being saved by that sweet message that the man in the middle was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Would you do something for me? As we bring this to a close, I want to summarize everything about the message, about that fourth nail, and in effect, nail it up in place for you to see this morning. If you could summarize everything that fourth nail was holding in place, here's what it would be. Whosoever will may come.